All right, so like I said, tonight's meeting is on how to protect your cucurbits. Um, I know that may not be a phrase that a lot of you are familiar with, so I'm going to describe cucurbits a little bit. Uh, most of these, you will understand what they are fairly quickly. So, first off, this is a fairly large family of plants. Um, cucurbits will include cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, and a lot of different gourds. So we not only use these for food, but a lot of them are also used in art and pottery and a variety of other things. And they have been for quite a long time as a part of human history. Now, typically when we think of these plants, we think of vining plants that we are going to be using for food. And a lot of these plants occupy several hardiness zones. They also occupy several periods of time when they're going to be grown. Uh, for example, right now, you probably are developing your summer squash or your cucumbers, whereas a farm in one of my counties, Nolan County, they're going to be working on uh, pumpkins before too long if they haven't started already. So we've got a pretty good variety represented by that one phrase. Now, as you probably gathered from what I was just saying, cucurbits are a warm weather plant. They do not handle frost very well, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a second here. And I mentioned that we typically think of vining plants we want to use for food. However, these are a little bit like tomatoes. They do have a vining and a bush type. Now, in my personal experience, I have encountered vining plants most often. Um, most likely, those are the easiest to develop for food because the fruit of these plants is heavy. It would not necessarily be good for a very bushy plant. So I imagine that a lot of you, when you're growing your squash and what have you, you're probably growing them from a vine. Now, cucurbits do have male and female flowers located on the same plant. Thankfully, they're typically pollinated by a variety of pollinators or a little bit of wind pollination. However, when you are choosing your plants that you want to develop, double check them. Some of them can be what's called dioecious. And that means that only one plant has female flowers and another plant will have the male flowers. So they will be separated by gender. Um, if you decide that you want to grow a plant that is dioecious, you need to make sure that you can get them properly pollinated so they develop that fruit. So when you are doing your cultivation, um, I have harped on this a lot in the last several programs. You guys are probably tired of me saying it but do some soil testing. It's cheap, it's relatively quick, and it'll get you a lot of information. Um, in my opinion, I would never try to grow something without first knowing what's going on in my soil. Most soil tests are going to cover the pH of the soil as well as what essential nutrients are present. Uh, they will not cover pathogens, unfortunately. That's a very expensive test. In this case, though, the reason I bring it up is because our cucurbits, in general, for the most part, will prefer neutral pH. Um, some of them may go as low as 6 or 6.5, but in general, that neutral level right at 7.0 is where you want to have these things. Now, in general, from what I've also seen, you want to try to go ahead and direct seed these plants. You can try to do transplants. However, the tap root on a cucurbit is fairly significant. And if you try to do a transplant, you don't want to run the risk of damaging that tap root. Now, when you do plant them from a seed, it's recommended that you plant them in kind of a mound or a hill to allow for better drainage. And you can even put in up to six seeds in an individual hill. And this is something you can just form yourself with a shovel in a little bit of time. Now, most of the time, not all six seeds you're going to want to keep there to develop plants. You're probably going to end up thinning out to about two or three, or you may just get two or three that end up developing. Now, I did mention before, cucurbits are sensitive to the cold, so you do want to plant these after that last frost date. These are very summer-oriented plants. They will not handle a freeze hardly at all. Now, that being said, um, we have a fairly good span of time that you can develop a lot of cucurbits in here in Indiana. I've seen as late as the end of September when there's spaghetti squash still growing successfully. So there's a broad range that you can work with depending on what your summer's like and how long the heat's going to last. Again, just like I said at a previous program, try to keep track of that first frost date, though. 
Uh, when I checked it the last time, October 9th was the estimated first frost date for this year. All right, a little bit of maintenance information on this. I already mentioned the taproot. The good thing about the taproot, since it is so deep, in general, they only require one inch of water per week, and our rainfall normally accounts for that. Now, if we are going through a dry period, like we did about a week and a half ago, um, you're probably going to be watering these a little bit more. But after that's done, if you're in a time like we're sitting in right now with high humidity and high heat, you probably don't need to worry about watering them. They don't require a lot of nitrogen. Uh, however, they will require a good amount of phosphorus and potassium. So if you are looking at fertilizer, uh, consider fertilizers that have a higher percentage in those two essential nutrients. The last thing I'm going to say about maintenance, and this is one that is kind of common sense, but um, I've made this mistake before, and I'm sure a few of you may have. You want to account for the space requirement. Cucurbits are vining, and they will just spread everywhere, um, and you're going to want to make sure that you have that space. Remember, the fruit that these develop are large, and if you want to get really good-sized fruit out of it, you're going to need to make sure that they have the space to develop. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into our diseases of cucurbits. I was originally going to do this by plant. However, just about every cucurbit shares the same diseases. So this will be pretty, pretty straight across the board for just about whatever you're planning on growing. Now, the first one that I've got pictured here is bacterial wilt. This is an Arwenia species, which is one that is very common in a lot of different garden plants. This one is fairly easily identified when the vines, you'll see a few vines begin to wilt and then it'll slowly spread to the rest of the plant until unfortunately the plant probably will experience a full die off. This one is spread by an insect known as a striped or spotted cucumber beetle. The good thing is, is that if you control the insect, you will avoid an incident with bacteria wilt. The bad thing is, is that this particular beetle is kind of everywhere. It's throughout the entirety of the United States. It can be in crops and row crops as a pest, and it can be in our gardens. So that means that you're going to want to monitor for this beetle. And I should have a picture later on in our presentation that's going to show you what it looks like. Now, powdery mildew. This is one of the nasty ones. This is probably the most common disease amongst cucurbits that we have. And the picture pretty much says it all. You'll, I believe we described priority mildew in a previous uh, session as well. This, this will cover the plant in these white powder-like spots. This is where a fungus is developing, and the white powdery substance there are the fruiting bodies of that fungus, where they're producing more and more spores. You can also see yellowing around the margins of the leaf, and if you look at the leaf veins, you can also see that they are also yellowing pretty heavily. Now this one is done by a couple of different species, and I'm going to spare you guys my pronunciation of these. However, I do want you to make sure that you understand that you want to look for white powdery growth on the upper surfaces of leaves and stems. Don't worry about the lower surface. The upper surface is what you're going to watch. This will eventually cause stunting and distortion in the vines, and ultimately it may mean that the vines is not going to be successful even if it just doesn't die. Uh, the best way to handle this is simply keep things out of the, the keep things sanitized. You want to make sure that you don't use soil that's had an incident with this before. This can be spread by insects. However, um, the best thing to do is to try to prevent it. Using a preventative fungicide in general is going to work the best for you. So another one of our mildews, the downy mildew, you can see what it's doing to this leaf right now. There's more significant yellowing on the leaf. You can see it's occupying individual intravenal spaces. However, the veins themselves are still green, so that's what's going to set it apart from our previous mildew that we just discussed. Now eventually that yellowing you see on the leaves is going to expand into a kind of brown lesion with irregular margins. However, the good thing is, is that it won't affect the fruits. The problem is, is that if the leaves are getting hit by this mildew, they're losing their capacity to perform photosynthesis. They're not going to be able to make as much food for the plant, so your fruits may be reduced in size. If it's really bad, the plant may forego even making fruit in favor of just trying to survive. 
The caveat to this is that you will see it develop on cantaloupe fruit. So if you're developing cantaloupe, you want to watch out for this. The way that we avoid this is our wet condition issues, something we've discussed a little bit before. Don't overwater. Remember, these plants don't need much. They can be transmitted through a variety of ways, but primarily if you are in a high humidity situation like we are now, I would be monitoring my plants. I would consider fungicidal applications. I would also monitor how much I'm watering. All right, now gummy stem blight. This is a nasty looking one. This one can be confused for damage being done by an insect, so I want to make sure to draw your attention to the way the stem looks here. If there is an insect damaging the stem of your vines, you're going to see openings, you're going to see what's called insect frass, their excrement. Um, this is not that case. Look at the little red spotting you see on the vines. This is an indicator of gummy stem blight. If you touch it with your finger, it's going to be a very sticky substance. It's going to be nasty. It may even on occasion have a smell if it's bad enough. All right, this one can unfortunately cause fruit rot to occur. What you want to watch out for is brown spotting on the leaves of your plants and splitting of stems. Eventually, you may see cankers form that will exude a brown substance. Now I'm going to go back to our previous slide here for just a moment. That brownish area where things don't look quite right, you can see if you look closely, it's starting to split apart. That's that canker that I just mentioned. And that kind of reddish substance is what the canker is exuding. That is your telltale sign that this disease is an issue. Now the spots, if they occur on the leaves, may have a ringed appearance, kind of like some of the diseases that we see in tomatoes. Unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of things you can do uh, after the plant has been infected. You're going to want to try to choose some resistant varieties. So what I would say is if you have experienced this before, growing your cucurbits, your cucumbers, your squash, what have you, um, then you know it's coming. Get ready for it. Choose some resistant varieties. There are a dozen different places that you can ask. And remember, contact your extension educator. That's what we're here for. We can help you determine what those varieties are. All right, Alternaria. This one is a popular one in our presentations. It goes everywhere. Um, you can look at the spots here to get an idea of what to look for on your plants. What we've got here is a brown spot. You can kind of see those concentric rings in those spots if you look closer. The center area is darker, and then the outer ring of the spots is lined with yellowing of the leaf. That's going to be a real easy way to tell if you have Alternaria. If you look at some of the spots too, there, if you have two spots close together, you can kind of see them beginning to distort the leaf in between as the spots grow and spread. And this is the fruiting body area of this fungus. Now, like I said, this one affects a lot of species in our garden, so this is one that we always have to be on the watch for. Remember, if you have grown tomatoes and you've seen Alternaria or early blight, you want to make sure you don't plant there again. The spots will enlarge, sometimes greater than an inch in diameter, and like I mentioned, you'll see that bullseye appearance with concentric rings. Eventually, you will experience severe leaf drop with this plant, and it, sadly, you'll probably lose the plant after it loses a number of leaves. This is another one where sanitation is important. We act as excellent spreaders of Alternaria. Clean your tools. Clean your boots when you go to the garden. Watch your overalls if you're wearing any, or your pants. There are any number of things you can avoid by just using a light bleach solution or even soap and water to clean your garden tools. Make sure you do that. You'll save yourself a massive headache. All right, there are several viruses that are going to affect a lot of cucurbits. I'm only going to cover one. If I covered all of them, we'd need a couple more sessions to talk about it. The big one that I'm going to mention is cucumber mosaic virus. Now, unfortunately, this picture doesn't really do it justice. You'll normally see a kind of browning and yellowing with a mosaic pattern to it. That's why it's gotten this name. Uh, eventually, the leaves will lose the capacity to photosynthesize, and a host of other problems will begin occurring, like stunting, uh, obviously, watch out for the leaf modeling there. 
This is another one that can affect your fruit. The virus will spread into the fruit as it develops off the blossom, and it will cause its shape to become irregular. Now, this is another one that is spread by insects. Um, if you control your insects, like if you have squash bug or aphids, something like that, get rid of them, and you will reduce the chances of you getting cucumber mosaic virus. Okay, blossom end rot is another one that we talked about a little bit before. Um, I believe we covered it in our session on tomatoes. Blossom end rot is actually not a disease. This is what happens when you have a, cal a calcium deficiency in your soil. You'll begin to see the blossom and eventually the fruit begin to get this browning and rotting at the end of it. Basically, the nutrients can't go through their normal processes because calcium helps the cells to do a variety of things and you'll get the rotting effect off of it. Easiest solution, make sure you've got good enough calcium in your uh, soil. This is why I want you guys to do a soil test. Even if you don't think you need one, just go ahead and do it. If you see where your calcium is very, very low, and if you're not sure how to interpret that test, bring it to an extension educator. We can help you with it, and determine if that calcium is low. Then that way you know you need to add something to your soil. You can easily avoid this one, and it'd be a shame if you guys experienced it. All right, so the last little bit of things I'm going to cover here, like I said, this one will be quick, is talking about a few of the insects to watch out for on your cucurbits. Uh, a few of them you're going to immediately recognize. A couple of them you may not very easily recognize. Now, in this case, what I'm showing you here, and I apologize for uh, clarity of the image, this is squash bug. This is one of our sap feeding insects. Um, what'll happen is you'll see this brown insect that you look at and you kind of think it's a stem, uh, stink bug, but it looks kind of slender and it may have these big leaf shapes on the ends of their legs. Um, they will feed on the leaf surfaces. They'll put their mouth parts that are kind of act like a syringe into the leaf and drain out the sap from the inside. Now, unfortunately, this means that they are very good at transmitting pathogens. So this one you want to watch out for. They will mostly attack squash and pumpkins. However, they can go after other cucurbits. So uh, you got to keep that in mind. Now, one other thing that I want to point out to you on this one is one image. The image on the left is showing you the insect. However, the image on the right is showing you what the eggs of the insect look like. This is on the underside of the leaf. So when you're doing your maintenance on your squash or your cucumbers, flip those leaves over. Look for eggs, because I guarantee you they're going to be laying them right now. And all you have to do is just scrape those eggs off. Don't put them in the soil. Put them in like a bucket of soapy water. And that'll take care of your problem before it ever starts. All right, the nastiest one, squash vine borer. This is the bane of anyone who grows squash existence. These things are nasty because we often don't realize that they're at work. So what I'm showing you, the image on the left is the adult. This is actually a moth. It is going to pretend to be a wasp. The image on the right is going to be our larva. Now what they do is they avoid predation because they look like wasps. They can kind of resemble a paper wasp if you're not looking too closely. They will emerge from the ground, from their cocoons, in late June, early July, so that is right now. And the larva that they eventually will lay eggs and have those larvae will burrow into the vines and begin consuming the vascular tissue on the plant. So you may ask, how do I get rid of these when they happen? Well, the first easy thing is put up some row covers. The adults are emerging right now, but they are not quite to egg laying yet. So if you get your plants covered, they will not be able to affect them. There are a few pesticides that will be labeled for them, and you're going to want to apply them now. Don't wait too long if you're worried about it. Once the larvae burrow into the vines, you're going to have to use a systemic pesticide to control them. And I'm willing to bet a few of you probably don't want to do that. Now the good thing is, is if you only have a few squash vine borer, your plant's probably going to be okay. I've seen uh, summer squash and spaghetti squash get two or three or even four of these developing in vines, and the vines were still successful. They still produced a decent number of fruit. However, the biggest problem comes when you get many, many more of them. 
and then eventually your plant will look healthy and green, but you'll begin finding spots where they've ruptured the plant's stems, and you'll see a bunch of gunk that's the, what the insect leaves behind, and most likely that plant is not going to survive that experience. So don't wait. Control these now. You have the opportunity. All right, the last thing I was going to go over tonight, this is one I've already mentioned this evening, the spotted and the striped cucumber beetle. Now, these are two different species. They are related, and their activity for our purposes is pretty much going to be the same. They're going to be leaf chewers for the most part on your plants. However, they are also going to be consuming the roots. So they're not restricted to any one plant. They're generalist feeders, so you can expect them on all your cucurbits and probably a few other things in your garden. The adults will be our leaf feeders, and you'll see them pretty obviously. They're, that bright yellow patterning stays very, very obvious. However, the larvae, as they begin to develop, will consume the roots of your plants. So this is kind of a double whammy when it comes to our insect pests. These are also pests in row cropping, such as corn especially. So if you live adjacent to a cornfield or even a soybean field, because they can't occur there, though not as much and it's not much in the way of numbers, um, keep your eyes open. Watch your garden. You may want to monitor these for a little bit. There are a variety of pesticides you can use to control these beetles. Uh, I would ask if you're planning on doing that, check with your extension educator. We'll let you know what works and what's safe to use, all right? All right, that is all I was going to go over in a presentation this evening. I've left my contact information up here if you want to get a hold of me. If you're in Owen, I've left the number. If you're in Clay, it's the same one, or another one, sorry. I've also put my email down there. I've also, on the other side, put up a link to our Purdue Ed Store, which has a lot of different uh, publications you can use if you're looking for some information on something specific. And I've also put up the link to our Pest and Plant Diagnostic Lab. If you have a problem that you just can't seem to figure out how to solve it, you can always send a sample to this lab and they will help you out. Now, obviously, with our pandemic currently going, uh, the timing may not be as quick as it normally is, but they are still open for business. All right, with that, uh, that is all I have for you guys for this evening.